Hey gang, uh, it's Brian here. Good to have you all here on uh, Thursday night uh, for this kind of special Thursday night Synergy Light Gathering. Uh, it's a special Thursday night for us. Obviously, hope you all like that image. Uh, someone sent that to me today of what would the Last Supper have looked like because tonight is that night we celebrate. Jesus would have celebrated with his disciples or did celebrate with his disciples the Last Supper. It's the night before Jesus goes to the cross and we've got a really special guests we're going to be unpacking that with but I, I love that image it was what would the last supper have looked like uh, in the age of uh, zoom and the coronavirus and so uh, trying to add a little bit of levity into these serious times so but just so thankful to have you all with us and uh, tonight's going to look a little different than a normal synergy obviously it's uh, we're here uh, via zoom but we've got a really special guest we're going to invite in in just a minute here with us and then uh, tomorrow we're going to do and I want to invite you all to a three o'clock prayer gathering. A three o'clock prayer is going to be kind of our Good Friday service, just a short little 15 minute or so service that we're doing three o'clock tomorrow on Good Friday. And want to invite you all there. That'll be on Instagram live. So uh, Dylan and Lydia are going to be hosting that. So three o'clock tomorrow is our Good Friday service where we, be, we will be doing uh, some worship uh, together during that time. So uh, tonight a little bit different, uh, but tomorrow we will be having some worship uh, at three o'clock for our Good Friday service with Dylan and Lydia. So uh, without any further ado, I want to go ahead and invite in our very special special guest tonight. And so we have with us Dr. Sandra Richter, and I think we've got her here via techno link. So I can't see on my screen on the way I could last night. There she is. Okay, I can see her now. Um, so we got Sandra Richter here. Sandy, because I've known, I've known Sandra and I've known each other for a long time and uh, got to know her when her and her husband, Steve, uh, they were at Asbury Seminary and, uh, you know, and that's, that's where I'd went. A number of people from around CSF uh, had, I don't, I never had the pleasure of having you for class. I mean, I know we were, you know, friends and had our good mutual friend, Jerry Walls, and, uh, but I never got to take your class, but I know, you know, Matt Dampier, someone much beloved in the CSF community, Jeremy Buchanan, Rob McDowell. Uh, so many other people from around CSF. Rob was campus minister right, uh, right before I was. And, you know, one of the things, I, I'll give Sandy her, her professional credentials, and then I'll tell you just a quick personal story, and then we'll, get, we'll jump in here. You know, Sandy studied, did her PhD work at Harvard. Uh, she is a, a world-class scholar, in, in especially in work with Deuteronomy, uh, you know, history, uh, the uh, history of the Old Testament, archaeology and the Bible, environmental concerns that uh, Christians should have in uh, and, and, and America in particular. I know you've studied and focused a lot on that. She's got a couple books on, uh, one's called The Stewards of Eden, what scripture says uh, about the environment and why it matters, and her classic Old Testament uh, study that we're going to be giving away uh, several copies of here tonight. So Ooh. if you just leave a little message and something, if you comment in the section, in the comment section, say, hey, love tonight, uh, like you know, Sandy's bookcase, Brian's bookcase, whatever. You just leave a little comment. We're going to do a drawing off that. We're giving away 10 copies of Epic of Eden tonight, which is a fantastic work. Even my mother-in-law, who was not a seminary student, Sandy, you, you've probably forgotten, my mother-in-law used to drive down to Wilmore, 25-minute yeah. drive from her house, just to sit in on Sandy's classes and, and, and be a part of her lectures. So uh, mm -hmm. she may be out there in Zoom land somewhere watching uh, tonight as well. So, uh, but, you know, love, love having Sandy here. And she's not only academically qualified, obviously, having taught at Asbury seminary then she went over to Wheaton College in Chicago and then she finally she keeps going west from Harvard on the east coast and now she's all the way out uh, in Westmont teaching in Santa Barbara California there and so we're just uh, we're thrilled to have her here but not only is she academically qualified to be here one of the stories I loved about Sandy was that uh, I know Rob McDowell who spoke at winter retreat this year and was the the campus pastor at CSF before I was you know he said when Sandy in class he said it just moved him to watch her sometimes in, in class reading the scriptures that she was teaching and would be even moved to tears. And that this isn't just an academic study for her. This is something that her and her husband, Steve, uh, both live out, not just as academics, but in a very personal way. Even went to a church, I believe, with Dylan Matthews. Is that right? Mm -hmm. You were part of mm -hmm. Dylan's church? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so Pete, uh, Pete, who's the, who's the pastor there, part of the CSF board now. So lots and Ooh. lots of uh, lots of overlap there. But um, well, Sandy, this is you know we've been calling this night the meaning of the meal, the lost significance of Jesus' mm -hmm. Last Supper. Uh, I I I think a good little short book, maybe sometime might be you, you could write a book called The Lost Supper. Uh, maybe uncovering the the lost uh, some of the lost meaning mm -hmm. that I think is 21st century Christians we just miss what was going on and that's why mm -hmm. man you, you gave 
gave this talk probably 15 years ago at CSF thereabouts, and it was just so eye-opening for, for everyone there. I know Sam Coons, mm -hmm. one of our staff, was a student then, and he, he was there at that, for, at that talk, and so helpful. And so I just want to jump in because, again, we, we, tonight is the night Jesus would have been having that last supper. Uh, we call mm -hmm. it Monday Thursday. In some traditions, they refer to Monday Thursday. Yeah. And, uh, you know, tonight's the night Jesus would have been having. He goes to the cross tomorrow. But so much is going on, and we, we miss it because of uh, the resurrection and the key, obviously, the centrality of that, the, the crucifixion. But we miss so much of the richness that's happening on this night. And so uh, I just want you to help us unpack the specialness of what's going on and help us see in a deeper way. And so let's start here. Let's start with okay. the, the cultural background, the religious background of what's going on, because it's not – this is Passover, but it's not just Passover. There's a lot of things going on in this week uh, – uh, in, in the Jewish tradition in that part of the world. So could you just start there and help us kind of unpack before we jump into the meal itself, what's the backdrop of what's going on? Sure thing. And first, I just got to say, it's so much fun to be um, with you, Brian, and to hear all of these names and see all of these faces. Uh, my heart is uh, still lives in Wilmore, Kentucky, and um, it's, it's just lovely to get a chance to reconnect. So thank you for the invitation. And even though we're out here in Southern California with all of the surfers and beach volleyball people, um, yeah, Central Kentucky, it's where our hearts are. <laughs> Love it. Um, okay, so what's the backdrop? Uh, well, according to the synoptics, so that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus has spent most of his ministry actually up in the north, which is the Galilee. So towns like Nazareth and Capernaum that you hear about throughout the Gospels, this is where Jesus has been doing his preaching. So for three years, he's been building a band of disciples. He would be, have been recognized as a young rabbi. Uh, he would have been recognized as a bit of a revolutionary because he's not formally trained. So there'd always be that question, who is this guy? What is, what is he doing? But anytime someone would try to ask those questions, the response would be, what he's doing is healing the blind and making the lame walk. And when he preaches, have you heard that guy preach? So there would have been uh, so much uh, just press following him around his ministry. And that sort of press, as you and I both know, in uh, corporations and unfortunately in denominations as well, uh, it not only piques curiosity, it can pique jealousy as well. So Jesus really has stayed pretty far away from Jerusalem throughout his ministry because he knows that Jerusalem is the Jewish seat of power. He knows that if he heads south, the more time he spends within reach of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin, the more he's putting himself and his ministry at risk. So when we enter the Holy Week, which really started last Sunday, right, with Palm Sunday and the triumphal entry into the city, Jesus' reputation has preceded him. Everybody knows who's coming to town. And when he shows up, you see the type of attention he draws, where people are immediately shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, this is the son of David. And all of those connotations would have communicated to both the crowd and to the overseers that the people of Judah, the Judeans, expect this son of David to step in and turn things upside down. They're certainly expecting a military coup. Uh, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees are expecting um, a, a turnover that they don't want, and the Romans are watching as well. So as he steps into Jerusalem, uh, lots and lots of politics and tension and uh, news press comes with him. Yeah, so... So you've got this this whole setup, and there's lots of scenes. I mean, isn't even some of the some of the stuff that's getting set up? It, it, I know there's something with even the donkey. I mean, it's so symbolic. Some of the stuff that we're seeing there, isn't there something about? Uh, uh, you're the you're the scholar here, so refresh me, sharpen my mind on uh, even with riding in on a donkey was highly symbolic. Mm -hmm. Is that is that is that correct? Yeah, highly symbolic and rehearsed in the text multiple times. Uh, the great Old Testament scholar Meredith Klein is the one who first taught me this back in Genesis 49. So we're, we're still in the story of the patriarchs. We hear about uh, the scepter of leadership um, being in the hands of the tribe of Judah. And Genesis 49 
we don't even know that Judah is going to be a thing yet. And we certainly don't know about David yet. But Judah is promised the uh, rod of leadership. And as the prophetic blessing goes forward, it talks about um, this one who would present himself on a donkey, the foal of a female donkey. And it's a very specific phrase. So a colt that's not been broken. And then this same word is picked up in Zechariah when Zechariah is speaking to a broken and exiled uh, Israel and is saying, O oh, daughter of Zion, don't grieve because I see in my prophetic vision, your king is coming to you, humble and riding upon a donkey. So Genesis 49, Zechariah 11, and then Matthew picks up the exact same language in order to signal to all of us that this at last is the fulfillment of that prophecy, that this son of David is coming to us and will at last free us. Yeah, that Matthew 26 passage, Sandy, and if you, if you don't mind, you mentioned you mm -hmm. made reference to it there about Jesus coming in, riding on the donkey. Let me just read this really quickly because I think it'll, it'll help set up uh, what we're talking about tonight. But it just says, mm -hmm. uh, starting in verse 20, uh, so I'm going to read about 10 verses here for us. It says, when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the 12, and while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after the other, surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, the one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The son of man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the son of man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, surely not I, Rabbi. Jesus answered, yes, it is you. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when, it, when I drink anew with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And so this mm -hmm. is this, uh, you know, tight scene of, you know, that Matthew puts together and there's other, other things we could talk about here, but just wanted to kind of give, especially if people are going, okay, what are we talking about here with the last supper? Some textual, bring, bring in, obviously bring in the Bible here, but so help us through that, that meal, that, that, that meal, you know, people talk about <laughs> yeah. a sweeter meal, uh, mm -hmm. walk us through that meal. I know there's different parts to the meal, different things mm -hmm. that are going on. There's different stages. And again, we miss so much of this. Yeah. And so if you just help us unpack the stages of what's going Going on and what Jesus is doing, how he's how he's taking some of the traditional categories and redefining them. So just walk us through what that meal looks like. Sure. And let me, if you don't mind, Brian, back up just a little bit more to talk sure. about what Jerusalem would have looked like on this yeah, night. A hundred percent, yeah. Okay, because this is Holy Week for them as well. These are the high holidays of the Jewish calendar. So there's an entire week of celebration that surrounds the Passover. And everyone and their brother and their uncle and their grandparents and their cousins and uh, the friends of the family, everyone's in Jerusalem for this big celebration. We're dealing with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and then the climax, this Passover meal, which of course we all know is the great celebration of the Exodus. So we need to realize that Jerusalem itself is absolutely packed out for this festival and every available space is taken. So I'll joke with my students about how Uncle Shlomo and Aunt Rachel are in the guest room, cousin Yossi and the four kids are in a tent pitched in the backyard, grandma and grandpa brought down their RV and are in the driveway. Um, every motel, hotel, YMCA, you name it, is packed out just like a big holiday in, in our experience, uh, there are merchants everywhere who are busy hawking their wares while people are rushing around getting ready for the festival. And on top of all of these crowds into which Jesus and the disciples are busy um, uh, injecting themselves in order to preach the gospel and, and bring the good news, we also have the fact that according to Josephus, at least, we have about 250,000 live lambs shoved into the city because everybody's got to sacrifice the evening before the Passover meal. So there is so much noise, so much hustle and bustle. Um, 
I, I'll often joke uh, with the West Coast students that this is like Disneyland during spring break, or it's like uh, the 4th of July in Washington, DC, or perhaps the Quidditch Cup finals. Hmm, so people everywhere, that kind of crowded. And Jesus has spent all day ministering to the crowds. Everywhere he goes, that guy, you know, is producing absolute fangirl frenzy. He's healing, he's preaching. And the best part for most of the folks who are watching and listening is that he's taking on the religious officials and he's winning. And so this everyday guy from East Kneecap Nazareth is actually out arguing the religious officials of the day. Can you imagine that kind of scene? And every time he does it, he uh, kind of punctuates the moment with something supernatural. So we need to realize that all around this meal that is happening in an upper room in a house somewhere in Jerusalem, the temperature in this city has been rising, rising, rising. And when Jesus sits down to this meal with his disciples, he knows that he has already been identified as a problem, and he knows that the religious officials are uh, planning to deal with him. So he tells his uh, disciples to go prepare the meal, so obviously it's going to be uh, Jesus and the disciples around the table. So how does um, Passover work? Because that's what they're here to celebrate, this high holiday of the Jewish calendar. So the first thing we need to realize is that Passover is kind of the Christmas Eve of Judaism. It is a special, sacred, magical kind of night. You know, when you pull down the shades and close the doors and it's just you and your family. And according to both tradition and liturgy, because this is a liturgical meal, they have a, a, a liturgy that they're responding to. That's why we call it a Seder. The word Seder actually means order. So there are rules. Um, so when the family gathers, it is every extended family and there's a patriarch of the clan that is gathering his children and his grandchildren to eat this ritual meal around the table. And what they're gonna celebrate and what they're gonna speak about is the Exodus. That's what the whole meal is about. Mm. So they're gonna recount the mighty acts of God uh, to each and every one of them. The Talmud actually required that every Jew for every generation celebrate this meal in and out of Palestine as though they themselves were there. So there's special attire, special foods, and, and the whole point is to remember, to remember the greatest single act of God's redemption of his people, the Exodus. And of course, this is that terrifying night when the blood of a spotless lamb was painted on the houses of those who dared to believe so that the death angel would pass over. So this is the night. And um, what most of us Gentiles don't realize is this Seder, this liturgy that's attached. So the first thing that would happen is the family would gather and there would be traditional meal uh, items just like we have traditional items for our Easter supper, for example. And by the time of Jesus day, the order that was described was a four part ceremony. And each of those parts was designated by a cup of wine. And hey, we like that part, right? So um, the first cup of wine um, celebrated the Kiddush, which is a PL imperative, actually, um, set it apart. So this was the moment when the patriarch said, okay, from this point forward, holy ground. And he would pray a particular uh, designated prayer. Everybody would drink a small glass of wine. And at this moment, the night is sanctified, set apart. We've stepped into holy space and holy time. Then the family would celebrate uh, specific appetizers, and these would be uh, bitter herbs dipped in salt water and a kind of apple, walnut, cinnamon kind of dip that was supposed to represent the mortar of the bricks uh, for the building projects in Egypt. And a second glass of wine would be consumed. And then the main part of the meal was the Haggadah, which in Hebrew most simply means the telling of the story. And the way that would work is that the youngest person at the table would ask a sequence of questions. And 
one of the things I love about Jewish tradition is that it's always a whole family affair. And so whoever was youngest got to ask the questions. And uh, the first question, why is it only unleavened bread that we eat? And the patriarch would answer, why the bitter herbs? And the patriarch would respond, why is it only roasted meat eaten on this night? And then why are there two dippings, the vegetables in the salt water and the bitter herbs in that special uh, sweetened sauce? And so it was in this fashion that our patriarch uh, got to tell the story and to instruct his family in the great tale of God's redemption of the people of Israel. And so they would share the entire meal together. And at the end of the meal, then the patriarch would raise a third glass of wine and would bless the meal and bless the people. And that third glass of wine was called the cup of redemption. And all of these things kind of grow as the years go by. So now it's called the great cup of redemption and um, thanksgiving for what God has done. Third cup. Then they would sing together the great Hallel, which is Psalms 115 to 118. And the fourth cup would be drunk, which would basically announce that the meal is over and uh, we have celebrated the exodus from Egypt, who we are as a people and what God has done. And that would close down the sacred space. So this is what the disciples and Jesus are doing on Maundy Thursday. They're celebrating Passover. And as far as the disciples know, this is just everyday Passover, just like we've done since we've been tiny children, ever since we've done since we were the little guy at the table who got to ask the questions. And Jesus is, is clearly operating as the patriarch of the group. So that's what's going on. Yeah. Well, so that gives us a great, you know, great little Jewish Old Testament kind of lesson here of what, what mm -hmm. is happening. So, but where does it start to get flipped? Because, you know, obviously this, this something happened, or something's about to happen, but how mm -hmm. does Jesus start to really tip his hand to the disciples to say, listen, if you haven't caught on yet, something special is about to happen. So how does Jesus, how, how do you see, even in this meal, not just the next day when he's on the cross or, you know, the, the resurrection, but even in the course of this meal, how do you see Jesus really starting to go, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to put this in some, some, we're, 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 we're rewriting the script of this meal. Exactly. Yeah. And that is what we're doing. We're rewriting the script. So um, when you're reading Matthew 26, it says while they were eating, Jesus took some bread. Now that is about as significant as pass the crescent rolls, please, right? There's going to be bread all over the table. This, this is a family meal. But the gospel says, and while they were eating, Jesus took some bread. And after a blessing, nothing unusual here, he broke it, okay, and he passes it out to his disciples. At this point, his disciples are just thinking, yeah, Jesus is being generous, making sure that Everybody gets a crescent roll. I don't know about your house, but in my house, they fight over the last crescent roll. Um, and then th this is when Jesus start tip starts tipping his hand. He says to his disciples, take, eat, this is my body. Now, this will not be the first time that the disciples have no idea what Jesus is doing, right? This has happened for the last three years. And these guys have gotten real used to holding on to their questions until he gets to the end because they don't want to look stupid in front of their colleagues. So this is my body. Hmm, what's going on here? And when he had taken a cup, Matthew goes on to say, and given thanks, and by the timing in the gospel, this has got to be that third cup. This has got to be the cup of redemption. This is after the meal. So he picks up the cup of redemption, and having given thanks, nothing unusual, he gave it to his disciples. So now he's passing his own cup around the table and he says, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Okay, Brian, it's right here that James throws an elbow into John and says, what the heck is he doing? <laughs> he forgot, yeah, has he forgotten the liturgy? He's messing it up. Is, you know, did he open the Book of Common Prayer to the wrong page? <laughs> you know, did he stick a post-it note in the wrong part in the hymnal? And they're like, uh-oh, he's messing it up. 
But I also am really aware that by this point in time, our disciples are probably pretty tired and pretty groggy. It's late at night. They've had a very long day. Everything in Jerusalem is uphill, it seems. And they've got at least three cups of wine in their belly by now. So uh, they're probably just catching on that something crazy is going on. And it's when they hear this phrase, for this is my blood of the covenant, that their ears perk up. Because as you know, what he's doing right here is he's actually quoting Moses. And the part of Moses that he's quoting is at the foot of Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 24, when Moses has come down off the mountain with the two tablets in his hands, and he's called out to the people of Israel, asking them, will you accept this covenant? And the people of Israel say, yes, we will. And so Moses sends out the young men, and he says, go get me a bunch of bulls and some sheep and some goats. We're going to have a sacrifice here we're going to ratify this great Sinai covenant. And so they slaughter the animals as would be the standard tradition. They recite the stipulations of the covenant. Moses takes the blood, he sprinkles some of it on the altar that he's just built. And then he takes the other half of it and he turns to the people and he says, do you mean it? And they say, yes, we're in. And so he sprinkles the blood on them and in this moment, in Exodus 24, at the foot of Mount Sinai, Moses seals the Old Covenant. And so what Jesus is doing right here at this moment at the Last Supper, and we Gentiles miss it, miss it but I can guarantee you not one of the disciples missed it, is he pulls that line out of the Old Testament story, like pulling the handle on a bucket, and he takes the bucket and he dumps it over his disciples' head. He quotes Moses, and every one of them realized that at this moment, Jesus is rewriting the story. What he's doing is he's reinterpreting the Passover of the Israelites, and he is transforming it into the communion of the Christian. At this moment, he's taking the ancient Passover celebration that celebrates God's deliverance of his people and he's reapplying it to this band of men sitting around the table. In fact, it's Monday, Thursday, in which Jesus declares the new covenant. Now, he's going to act it out on Good Friday at the crucifixion and certainly on Easter morning at the resurrection. But at this moment, he declares to a new people of God that he is sealing the new people of God to himself in exactly the same way that Yahweh sealed the people of Israel to himself at the foot of Sinai. It's, it's staggering what happens at this little meal. Mm. Wow. Yeah, Sandy, just hearing you unpack that again just brings it uh, in such a fresh light to me. Uh, again, hearing as you just give us so much of the, the background and unpacking that for us. You know, as, as Christians, you talk about this significant meal within, you know, the Jewish uh, tradition. But as Christians, we have a very significant meal. And there's a church uh, right around the corner from our house that did uh, drive-by communion tonight, you know, the, because... Oh. You know, you can't you can't get everybody in there and serve and celebrate a service. So they they did a drive back communion uh, because they want to celebrate this meal as Christians. So you know that is a particularly special meal for Christians celebrating communion. How mm -hmm. would you say if someone said, okay, so Sandy, what does this mean for us when we come to communion? When mm. Christians celebrate communion, how does this impact how we view what's going on in that meal? Yes. Yeah. Well, as Jesus takes these two events and he merges them. With the Exodus, we are told that a mixed multitude is brought out of darkness into his marvelous light by means of the Declaration of the Covenant. When Peter picks this up in 1 Peter, he says the same thing, that you and I have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light because once again, Jesus has called a mixed multitude out of darkness into his marvelous light. But this time, oh my goodness, you know, this time it's not just the children of Abraham. And this time, we're not simply being delivered from Egypt. Okay, now I'm going to cry. This time, the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve are being delivered from hell itself. So the plan is so much bigger. 
and this time the oaths are not being sworn simply in the blood of bulls and lambs and, and goats. This time the oaths are being sworn and sealed with the blood of God the Son. So when we come forward and we take the communion, what we're doing is taking the, the smallest possible symbols of this great moment. And we're being asked a question at the communion meal. And the question we're being asked is, do you remember, just like the Jews around the Passover meal, do you remember what it is God has done for you? But perhaps even more so, we're being asked the question, are you in? Is this yours? Are you willing to re-up? Is this your faith? Or is it a faith that belongs to your ancestors, your pastor? Are you in? It's funny, you had mentioned um, Pete Matthews when we launched this, uh, the pastor of St. Pat's Anglican Church in Lexington, Kentucky, our pastor and the pastor who baptized both my girls. And when I was a member of that church, I had the amazing privilege of being the toddler church pastor. Now, I am not particularly good with free abstract thought people, yeah? This is not my, my special gifting, but we were a church plant. We needed a children's program, and I had children, so I was in. So I got to teach the, the great story to two and three and four-year-olds who were pre-literate, and I had a lot to learn. But one of the things we did during Holy Week is we reenacted the Last Supper. And I can still see their amazing, wonderful faces around me. And what we did is we made some really sweet cornbread and we cut it up in cubes and we got grape juice and poured it into a special wooden cup. And uh, I told the story and they were all in. And uh, Pete helped me with this because of course we're an Anglican church and I'm a mere parishioner at this point in time. Um, and there are rules. But uh, I asked my kids, my little tiny kids, as you, know, as you reach into the basket and you take your little cube of cornbread and you sip out of the cup, do you remember Jesus? And do you belong to Jesus? Because I had to distill the liturgy down to its essential components. And I can see Ella Barker's little face, and I can see my daughter, Noelle, and I can see Ainsley Matthews. And they would reach into that basket like, like it was so holy. And they pulled out their little piece of cornbread, and they'd look me in the eyes, and they'd say, I remember Jesus, and I belong to Jesus. Mm -hmm. I was a mess by the time we finished this little ceremony. And that is what I believe this meal asks us every single time we take it, and certainly on Monday, Thursday. Do you remember Jesus, and do you belong to Jesus? This is what this ceremony demands of us, and it demands an answer. And God help us if we're not ready to truly answer that question, if we dare reach into that sacred basket. Mm. Well, I suppose it's my turn to cry because, uh, <laughs> man, I'm just, my eyes are filling up with tears is, you know, because you do a lot of stuff to try to put these things. I've got three young kids and trying to put things into their context and to understand, but just to boil it down into there to say, you know, do you remember Jesus? Do you belong to Jesus? You know, mm. um, that, that is absolutely beautiful. Sandy, thanks so much for being here with us tonight and just helping us to understand this and in in just some of the richness of it. Again, I'm, I'm going to email you about this law. I got an idea for the Lost Supper uh, okay. uh, idea. But uh, hey, before we go, and I've got a couple of closing announcements because uh, we're we've got an after thing we're going to do on Instagram Live in a couple minutes and just want to encourage people to sign up for some groups. I'm going to hit that. Before we do, would you mind just praying for us tonight on this, on this really special night? I would be honored. Yeah. Thank you. So Lord Jesus, we, we gather together on this Maundy Thursday. And I know that the word Maundy comes from the Latin word for commandment. The commandment has been offered to us. We've, we've been invited into this covenant by what you've provided for us, Jesus. We, we know that when you sat at that table, you, know, you knew what was coming. And so you offered to your disciples this last ceremony that they could hold on to it and hope for the future, knowing that as you set down the fourth cup, you said, I'm not gonna drink this one until we're together again. So Lord, we're, we're sitting in the middle of a planetary pandemic. 
and we are alone in our houses and we're worried and we're frightened and we need that Easter morning. So Father, as, as we sit here on Monday Thursday and we declare to you, yes, I remember and yes, I'm in. Will you also fill our hearts with the hope of Easter, knowing that there is no darkness that your light cannot penetrate. And Lord, our souls, our lives, our every hope are placed into hands that have sworn their love to us by their very life. You, God, have given us everything you could. Will you help us, Lord God, to give you the same? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Sandy, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, go enjoy your uh, late afternoon there in, uh, in Santa Barbara. I will do that. And blessings to you and to all the folks who are listening. Yeah, thanks, Sandy. Appreciate it. Easter.